Cheers, Homo. Welcome to the final installment of Season 1 of the BAPS Campus Podcast Series. Throughout the season, we have heard from experts in areas ranging from medicine to graphic design. And in today's episode, we will be exploring the field of aviation with the help of our host Vivek Bhai, who is currently studying for his A-levels. Vivek Bhai will be talking to Minesh Bhai, an airline pilot who graduated with an air transport pilot's license from the British Aerospace Flying College, Scotland, in 1989. Minishpai has accumulated over 18,000 hours of flight experience within the past 32 years. This podcast will explore how he got into aviation and what motivated him to pursue this successful career in the skies, as well as any advice he has for students. Let us now hear from Vivekpai and Minishpai. So, dear son, guys, and um, welcome to our podcast this week. So, firstly, uh, I would like to thank uh, Munish Bai for taking out his time uh, in his very busy schedule to talk to us about his role in the aviation industry. So, first question, what inspired you to be a pilot? Well, that probably goes back quite a long way, Derek uh, Bay. Uh, so, uh, just on I. Um, I have to say, I've probably always had a fascination uh, with fast machines and big machines. Yeah, I've always uh, had that technical bent when I was a, a kid, used to take things apart, TVs. Sometimes I couldn't put them back together again, machines, et cetera, et cetera. So I've always loved uh, machinery and, and especially anything that moved. So I guess it seems like such a natural fit that aeroplanes would come into my sphere of uh, interest. Um, but I think the first thing I ever remember is... Um, When we uh, originally, I was born in Nairobi and uh, we came to the UK and I went back to Kenya for a short while. And still to this day, I can still remember traveling on a a Super VC-10, which landed at Cairo Airport and then at Heathrow. And somewhere along the line, a bug just bit. Um, And then we moved to Hounslow. And whilst we were living in Hounslow, I think aircraft are a sort of unavoidable part. And I know you live <laughs> in the, sort of near the vicinity of the airport, uh, you know, the noise. And we had airplanes um, literally on the approach path right over our house. So it was as a kid, it was hard to uh, hard to avoid. Um, my uncle was also uh, in the Royal Air Force uh, in the late 60s and, the, um, and during the 70s at um, RF Northolt. And um, at that time, he would take me to the uh, RAF base and I would see Spitfires and Hurricanes um, on their static displays, um, see other airplanes in the, in, in the hangar. So all of that kind of rubbed off on me. So if there was any interest that was going to light my fire, it was going to be, um, going to be uh, uh, airplanes. And, and then I suppose it was a little bit self-motivated from, uh, from there. Uh, I used to go to the airport uh, quite a lot with my dad and family members. We'd be at the top of the car park watching airplanes take off uh, uh, and and, uh, and land. And then um, I would suppose that probably my interest became even more serious when um, I went to first to a boarding school where um, a lot of the uh, pupils there were sons of Air Force officers. So airplanes were very much all around me. Um, even our dormitory was called the Tornado uh, Dormitory and downstairs was called Spitfires. And the, the, the headmaster there was uh, an ex-World War II bomber pilot. So I, I just couldn't get away from it. <laughs> um, or, uh, and when I started um, day school at the age of 12, I joined the cadet force, uh, the Royal Air Force cadets. Um, there it was called a CCF and started um, uh, going up for air experience flying from the age of, uh, from the age of 12. So it's, it's, it's always been there. But for most of that time, I never really thought I was going to be a pilot, only because I thought it was always going to be out of reach for me. So in some respects, and also um, there weren't any other people within our community, either the, 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 the Indian community or the Hindu community that I knew of that was, a, that was a pilot. So there wasn't somebody that I could follow in the footsteps of or feel that has already trailblazed the way for me to become a pilot so i kind of put it aside and thought yeah this is really great it's a fantastic interest i really love it it's a hobby um but i think i'm gonna have to go off and be an engineer because i just thought it was totally out of reach um so ultimately um 
the inspiration probably came when I was 14 years old. And when I thought, well, perhaps this is a reality is when I used to write letters to Pujaman Sami Maharaj um, quite a lot um, then. I kind of always saw him as like everybody's favorite uncle, you know, at that time. It's that kind of bond that you have. And um, uh, I, I, I wrote to him and I said, you know, I love airplanes. And, and I said, I would like to become a pilot, but I don't think it's going to be within my reach and I'll, 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 I'll probably become an engineer. And he wrote a letter back when I was 14 uh, that was in 1981, and and and, and said um, we we pray for your success as a pilot. And and I remember the words; it was lovely. He says you'll become a smashing and dashing pilot. So I might not be that smashing and dashing, <laughs> but um, but nonetheless, it came about. And when that came through, I thought, well, maybe this might just happen. It's difficult to have faith in those words at that time when the environment is so difficult and you can't see the path to becoming a pilot. But um, that then stayed with me and was always in the back of my mind and in my heart as to whether uh, this just might become a reality uh, for me. Um, so that, I would say, is probably, you know, the childhood interest and Simon's letter in making it think that this might just be a possibility for me. Um, so, yeah, uh, those like little ashirads and that really make an impact on where you're going to go next and it just gives you that little motivation uh, and talking about motivations there are lots of aspiring youths uh like like myself who want to pursue a career in aviation could you just give us a little you know advice from your experience on how we can you know uh, step up and you know obviously pursue a career as being a pilot so, um, yeah, a career in aviation um, is extremely fulfilling. If that's what you want to do, I would say the first thing you've got to have um, is a passion for it. Um, it's uh, an industry which, as we know, is very cyclical. Um, you know, it's feast or famine. Um, as we've seen um, recently, you know, COVID has probably been one of the most damaging events um, uh, in the history of aviation at the moment, you know, with, with all the restrictions of travel. But it is an extremely resilient um, industry as well. You know, in the heart of everyone, everyone wants to travel, everyone's got connections to make. Um, and even though we go through these difficult times, which just seemingly seem to stop all of global aviation, um, somehow, um, as humans, we find a way around it, you know, where our desires take us. And, the, the, you know, we're starting now to see the green shoots of recovery already occurring. And we've had it before. We've had it in 9-11. Um, we've had it during volcanic ash uh, events. We've had it during SARS in the past. And the aviation industry has always come back onto its feet again. So I would say that you've got to have a passion because you've got to believe that when these challenges come your way, that you will put all of your uh, effort and focus into still continuing to pursue the path because at some point um you know vacancies uh, and opportunities uh, always always do come about um i would also say that it's important to be realistic about your goals as well um you know if you're going to go in to do some pilot training which can potentially be very expensive you know i mean probably no more expensive than some of the loans that people come out of university with. But, you know, you're talking in the order of about £100,000. Um, that to some extent, whilst timing might be everything, you need to make sure that you have a backup plan, undoubtedly. Um, it, you know, being a pilot is a little bit of a niche kind of um, career, it's either you're going to go in to fly airplanes or you're not having done a pilot training course. You know, it's, it doesn't offer you a broad spectrum of careers um, after that. So when you go about however it is getting loans or borrowing that kind of money to go, go off and train, I would probably recommend that beforehand pursue um, an academic path as well. So I was very willing, had the opportunity come up probably to, to give up school because it's just tempting. You just think, I want to jump onto this. But actually, I was advised maybe to continue um, my study and go into um, doing a degree um, as well. Because in that time, if an opportunity comes up for going flying, take it. 
Um, but obviously, if you've then spent a load of money and the job isn't quite there, at least you'll have a career to fall back upon in the meantime and to perhaps pay off, pay off some of the debt until a pilot job uh, comes up. Because I've seen people um, literally just jump without thinking and just borrow the money. They've been fascinated by the career. They've been fascinated by the glossy brochures about pilot training, borrowed the money, and then immediately afterwards haven't found a way of furnishing their finances um, because they've got nowhere else to go. And it makes for a very difficult life after that. Yeah, uh, that's, you've mentioned a few routes. So you've mentioned, obviously, flight training, going to a school, and you've also mentioned universities. So could you just give us, uh, obviously, an insight of what training or what route you took uh, in order to become a pilot? Right, so my route to being a pilot was a very, very fortunate one. Um, I mean, I obviously joined the cadet force at school, which gave me some exposure to um, flying. And then um, that was all the way through until um, I did my A-levels. And at that time, I was still thinking I was going to be an engineer, um, but I, I wanted to join the Royal Air Force. But um, as I also wanted to go to um, uni to go and study, I applied to the RAF for a sponsorship and they had cadetships and bursaries at that time, which meant that whilst you were studying at university, um, they essentially they paid you. Um, but during your holidays, you went off to um, be on an Air Force base um, and it would be a good learning experience. You'd get some leadership training, but more importantly for me, um, you would get more flying uh, in uh, as well. So by doing that, I was able to do some flying alongside my um, degree course um, as well. But just rather fortunately, towards the end of my degree, um, British Airways were offering fully paid sponsorships uh, for pilot training. So they would teach you literally from zero hours right the way through to going into the right hand seat of a, of a, of a, of a wide body jet. Um, sadly, those sorts of schemes are few and far between now. Uh, I don't know. I think there was one that was being run by one of the Middle Eastern airlines up until fairly recently. Um, so I was quite lucky that I had all of that paid for. The difference now is that the airlines expect you to pay for your own training. Now, that's all well and good, providing they tag you um, or at least give you um, uh, uh, an opportunity to, to, to join them once you've completed the training. And um, airlines like British Airways, when times get going again, um, provide that sort of tagging scheme with some of um, some of the flying colleges like CA Oxford. So you can go onto this tagged airline scheme where you actually have to come up with the finance um, you go and do what's called a, uh, an integrated ATPL course and an MPL course, which enables you to get your commercial pilot's license. And at the end of it, because the airline have already looked at you from the beginning, they always know that you're going to be a prime candidate for recruitment as well. So once you get to the end of that course, um, you will find that if they're recruiting at that time, um, they'll take you on. And that's probably the best way to get into civil aviation um, directly. I was... Um, even planning myself to go into the Air Force as an engineer and then transfer across to uh, what they call general duties, which is flying. And then maybe after a period of flying in the Air Force to then join the airline. So that's another another potential route. That probably doesn't suit everybody, um, but nonetheless is probably a lower cost route of uh, getting, into, uh, getting into the airline. But, you know, there are varied ways, but you just need to be a bit careful about how you structure your finance and your route. So, apart from flying uh, around 35,000 feet, taking in a mesmerizing view, uh, is there anything else you enjoy about being a pilot? Um, yes. I mean, I have to say just flying the aeroplane is, uh, uh, brings me a great sense of uh, satisfaction. Uh, like I said, you know, I got to think about machines and fast machines. So, you know, flying a 300 ton jet around the world still brings back that sort of childlike sense of sense of wonder. Um, so, you know, if I didn't do it as a job, then it probably would have been um, an expensive hobby for me anyway. So um, I get the satisfaction from that. Um, and who doesn't want to travel? You know, um, uh, you know, most of us want to uh, want to travel. So I've had the opportunity to visit quite a number of countries that I would have never have thought of going to. Um, uh, before. 
So that's, you know, been amazing for me. And in fact, some of the places that we holiday on as a family now are places I would have never have gone to before and just discovered, um, uh, you know, places that just become our happy place. And it's great. And it's also working with uh, within a team of sort of like-minded people who are all very mission focused. Um, and it comes with its challenges and it's great times as well. You know, I literally work with a different team every time I go flying. And then very occasionally I'll come back to someone that I've flown with um, uh, before. There's also the um, varied work environment. I'm someone that needs change all the time. Um, and while stability and the same environment might suit others, for me, um, I like to meet um, different people. I like to work at different times. I mean, um, you know, tonight we'll be flying back um, through the night, um, you know, and then my next flight will be flying through the day. That uh, just brings some variation in and also different work locations. Yeah, you know, I have to say it's one of the best office views in the world. One minute it's an ocean, the next minute it's a desert, the next minute it's mountains, then it's stars, and then it's the northern lights. So, you know, there's nothing to, to not like about that. But also, I like to be challenged. I get bored if I'm not challenged. And whilst um, flying an airliner might seem, at least from the outside looking in, a routine, uh, repetitive kind of job i mean the weather always changes we have to face challenges with um weather you know last time i was down with the Car caribbean with hurricane ida trying to figure out how we're going to land where we're going to go to um if the hurricane um strikes you get you know you've got 300 people at the back um not everybody's the same and somebody falls ill you got to think about diverting uh, occasionally you get technical issues which you have to deal with um uh, as well and just on occasion, we get the uh, privilege and the opportunity to do some really, really special flights. And whilst I've done some VIP flights for Tony Blair and everyone else, my my my, my special opportunity has always been flying um, our Santos and most of all our Guru um, uh, around the world. 2017 with Bujaman Sami Maharaj and in 2000, uh, Pramuk Sami Maharaj. And that's just something that was beyond the wildest of my dreams. And And being in this job, um, just had the opportunity to have had that one-to-one -one time and to do something which would normally be a hobby for me as a sewer um, as well. So I'm, I'm really lucky and I, I think a lot of other pilots who are not in Satsang, you know, don't have that kind of opportunity and that other facet to it. Um, and, and so, yeah, performing, uh, performing sewer as well uh, in my flying duties. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that some of our younger members of our, of our satsang are going to follow rapidly in my footsteps because I'm getting close to retirement now <laughs> and we need someone to take on the sewa as well. <laughs> so, yeah, as you mentioned before, obviously you'll be traveling a lot. Uh, you were saying you travel day, night, uh, different locations. How would you maintain your satsang as well as manage your work life? Because it must be quite hard to, you know, obviously go to another country and obviously it's going to be different like time zones and then obviously the, the environment is quite different. So how do you maintain obviously your satsang and uh, perform daily rituals? So I guess the key thing uh, to that is uh, determination and making sure that you don't become complacent in your, um, uh, in your niams particularly. Um, I mean, people have different images about um, what goes on, you know, when you're away from home um, and you've got time to yourself in the hotel, you know, you haven't got your family around you, you haven't got um, anyone from satsang around you, and potentially you're going to some countries where there isn't even a mandir um, uh, nearby. Um, and I think following our niyams is, 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 is primary. I mean, you know, the, the simple one, first of all, puja. Um, I always make sure that the puja is one of the first things that I pack. I mean, I have on occasion probably be able to count on maybe in 33 years. I'll probably count on two hands when I haven't, uh, when I have maybe left my puja um, at home. But making sure that we still carry out our um, our daily rituals. Um, also, being very careful about um, food. Um, you know, there are some countries where vegetarianism is not the norm. And it can be quite challenging to find food. So having the discipline to sometimes pack things. I'm very lucky. My, um, my, my, my wife has been very supportive. And she knows when I go to a country where uh, food can be a challenge, she often packs me 
um, uh, with with things. And also in social matters, I think our niyams um, and our norms in satsang guide us neatly to make sure that we don't end up in situations which uh, could compromise um, morality um, or even compromise the potential for you to retain your job. I mean, alcohol being um, one key thing there. So you're with teams who have a different attitude about what it what it takes to have a good time down route. You've just got to be confident in your heart, follow your niyams, um, follow our rules and norms of satsang. And for me, my way of doing that is just visualizing that Maharaj and Swami are with me at all times, because sometimes, just on occasion, you might end up on your own because, you know, everybody else wants to go off and do one thing and you know that it's not good for our satsang to do, you know, so you end up staying staying in your room. But um, you never feel alone when you think that you have uh, Maharaj and Swami. But on the plus side, um, you know, what a great opportunity I've had to take crew to our mandirs as well. And um, I guess people over time have got to know me um, for um, taking crew to the mandir. So whenever we go to Delhi, um, we take the crew um, to Akshadam and um, uh, Puja Namuni Swami um, puts on a great tour for them. They, um, they're all, uh, they all have dinner there. Um, they absolutely uh, come back for want of a better word, gobsmacked by what they've seen uh, in there and actually helps to educate them um, in uh, the Hindu Dharma as well. Um, so it's a, good, it's a good way of actually introducing um, our satsang uh, to, uh, to other people. We've done the same in Mumbai. You know, we've taken the local train and given them the experience of um, being at Dadar Mandir uh, as well. So you can always put a new slant onto... Um, social activities for the crew, but otherwise they do the, can potentially do the routine thing, you know, maybe sit by the pool or go off sightseeing and say, well, hey, just just come with me. This is something you've never seen before. So that that's always great fun um, uh, to do. So that that's kind of broadly, um, you develop a bit of a routine um, for satsang when you're uh, away from home. So obviously, being a pilot is not your typical nine to five job. So getting up around seven o'clock, uh, traveling to work, and obviously waiting for uh, like six, seven hours until you come back. You, you obviously work at night, day, et cetera, et cetera. So could you just give us a little insight of a day in the life of a pilot? So I'd, I'd have to say, yeah, a day in the life of a pilot or a night in the life of a pilot. Um, there are some things that start, uh, in a fairly routine way. Uh, I'm very lucky. Um, I also do other roles in the airline, like um, training and examining pilots um, as well. So I kind of, my days can be quite varied. Um, so for what we would call a line pilot, someone whose sole role is is, is flying aircraft, um, a typical uh, day would involve actually start probably the day before where you know where you're going to go and you start to want to get a sense of, okay, what's the weather like there? What are the political issues going on uh, in that country? Um, who's my team? What aircraft have I got? What sort of flight plan there is and what kind of worldwide weather is taking place there? Um, what are the rules and regulations of that country? So you, you need to start building what we call situational awareness for where you're about to go. And you start to think about the challenges and obstacles that that's going to present you with. Uh, tomorrow, either in terms of safety, punctuality, or trying to deliver the best commercial interests of the airline. Um, so once you've done that, I tend to start gathering my thoughts and pulling some notes together. Then the following day is, um, um, I wouldn't say so much routine, but has a, a typical critical path that we follow. So um, we would uh, report at uh, Heathrow uh, for us at, uh, at Terminal 5 and um, meet the crew and I would um, start the flight planning process where we look at the route uh, and we look at how much fuel we want to put on the aircraft. Uh, we look at all the countries we're flying over, um, any issues with the airfield we're going to, weather, et cetera, et cetera. Then we also try and create contingency plans to think, well, that's the plan for success. Um, should the weather change or our routing change, what are we going to do then? So we're constantly thinking of scenarios that could cause us difficulties and make sure that we have strategies for getting out of them. That's quite a, quite a prime job for a pilot. 
Um, then I'd brief my cabin crew, perhaps lay down some of the expectations we've got, looking at the customers we've got on board and some of the challenges that we might have on that flight. So if we've got thunderstorms out of Heathrow or thunderstorms are going to go, you know, I'm going to have to make sure that I continue to be responsible for their safety by briefing them about the activities they should and shouldn't engage in, et cetera, et cetera, and how to keep the customers safe. Um, we would then walk out to the aeroplane, we would do our pre-flight preparation. We also are very much part of coordinating the activity around the aeroplane to make sure that the loading, the dispatcher, the fueling, uh, the boarding of the passengers, all of that comes together so that, you know, we're literally to the minute doors closed and we're ready to go at our scheduled time. Um, and then once we push back, um, it's, it's, it's all about flying the aircraft safely. There is, contrary to what most people think, there is still quite a bit of manual flying that goes on, albeit for short periods, but it's usually the fairly intense parts of when we taxi out and we take off. And then it's all the close to the ground parts of the aeroplane and when we do the approach uh, and, and landing. But to a large extent, when we're airborne, we're kind of monitoring fuel uh, we're checking on navigation, keeping in communication with air traffic control, and just keeping general awareness of where we are in time and space and relative to, to other aircraft. And, and then it's very much a role of, of decision making, coordinating things with your crew, and just dealing with problems that arise as you go. I uh, probably use a more positive word, challenges, because that's what we enjoy doing. It's great because you just don't know what's going to happen um, next. Um, you know, I've been to places where you get there and you're on the approach, uh, particularly where I am at the moment, and, and all the lights would just go off, you know, in the dark on the runway. So you can't see the runway anymore. And you think, wow, didn't expect this. What am I going to do next? And they're typically sort of time critical decisions. So it's great if it's um, if you enjoy solving problems within short spaces of time. It's a very satisfying job from that viewpoint. Um, I'm long haul pilot, so I get the opportunity once we land. We set the parking brake and then we're off to the hotel. Um, you've got to look after and, and ensure that you maintain um, uh, welfare for the crew, look after the welfare for the crew. And you also got to make sure you maintain discipline and again, making sure everyone acts in the best interest of the, uh, of the customer. And then that routine largely repeats itself for when you do the return flight. If you're a short haul pilot, you might actually end up doing four flights in the day and end up back at home. And that suits some people's lifestyles because they would probably rather be in their own bed um, at night and it would suit their family circumstances more. Um, and if that's what you want to do, then you can do short haul flying. But they work very hard as well, doing multiple flights in a day. So obviously every role in uh, being a pilot or like, say, in your people working under you, there has to be difficulties and obstacles. Could you give us a few examples of uh challenges you've had to face and how you've had to overcome these situations please yeah as, uh, as i was saying um earlier uh, uh Ray, that you know the aviation industry as a whole faces um challenges on a on a day-to-day -day basis and at some point it comes and visits the individual um as well so it depends on um the individual you know their circumstances as to what is challenging um, for some people, it could be being stuck down route, um, not expecting to. I mean, in the most extreme cases, we had um, the time back uh, in the first Gulf War when a whole crew ended up stuck in uh, Iraq whilst there was conflict going on. I mean, that's probably a very um, uh, unique um, situation, but being pulled away from family, I haven't personally encountered that sort of thing. But I've been around at the times of 9-11 uh, when, uh, as an operations manager, um, the whole operation was quite literally um, falling apart with crew being stuck um, all around the world and with me having to deal with the issue um, back at Heathrow. And you're quite literally um, every, every day off, minute of the day and, and, and evening was just taken up being on the phone, dealing with crew um, and, and, and their difficulties and their problems down route. Um, and that carried on for a sustained um, period of uh, period of time. We're not flush with people. We're generally quite an efficient um, industry. So you haven't often got many people that you can call upon to come to your, uh, come to your aid. And I do remember at that time um, feeling like I wish the whole world would just open up and swallow me up. I mean, the stress levels were particularly high um, at that time. 
And I have to say that um, thankfully we have satsang um, and I wrote to Puja Mansai Maj uh, at that time because um, he is our only resort to write, write, write to. And I got a five page uh, letter back, which had so much inspiration and so many um, prasangs in there and incidences during Parampuja Pramukh Swami Maharaj's life and Maharaj's life. And then when you look at their difficulties, suddenly mine just sort of paled into insignificant. And he, and he also reminded me to count my blessings. And, and this is probably one of the most um, um, poignant things for me is that, you know, when these challenges occur, we always look at, you know, we can focus on what's going wrong instead of what's actually going right. And he always told me to count my blessings. And since I've done that, um, these challenges don't seem to bother you so much. I mean, I've had a fair few. You know, I've been stuck stuck down route. Um, you get challenges with the family, you know, when you're expecting to be home at some time and suddenly your schedule's changed and you're down route and you can't come back. Um, I've seen other crew go through um, go through difficulties, but I've always remembered what, Swami has written his letter. In fact, I carry it with me uh, all, all, all the time. So I never feel alone and I don't ever feel overwhelmed um, as much as I used to uh, in, in, in the past. So in the past year, a uh, year and a half, COVID has admittedly damaged the aviation industry, putting many airlines in bankruptcy and as well as making many pilots uh, redundant. Uh, and obviously, there's been around a reduction of 49% of total passages in 2021 compared to 2019. Um, so how does how does 2021 uh, as a year in the aviation uh, obviously defers to pre-COVID and what do you make of the new environment? Yeah, um, these, these last two years have been perhaps the biggest challenge for the aviation industry in its entire um, history. Um, we have seen a number of colleagues, sadly, um, leave the airline. And whilst we were hoping that the recovery would come a lot sooner, obviously it's taken quite a protracted period of time. Um, the um, industry had to react extremely fast. The first thing that aviation industry always does is it tries to cut its costs. And the only way that they do that is um, really, apart from looking at their finances, um, the first thing they try to do is cut staff. Um, which is what happened in the British in British Airways, and, and this is the first time in uh, the whole of British Airways' history that it's ever made um, pilots um, uh, redundant. But thankfully, you know, with Bapas there, majority of the pilots were still uh, retrained, re, um, uh, retained. There's still a very strong sense of camaraderie in the airlines, particularly amongst pilots, that they will do things to ensure that other pilots don't end up suffering redundancies so uh, across the board a lot of my colleagues um, you know we all took a significant pay cut to make sure that we could fund some pilots to remain still on the books in the hope the recovery would come um, soon so there's that great sense of camaraderie it's almost like a family type uh, environment where we try to protect um, everyone else and also as far as the airlines concerned they're very resourceful very flexible as well you've got to be in order to um, survive um, British Airways um, started taking up cargo contracts. So we've been flying cargo from the Far East um, to the US, anything from um, PPE um, to rubber from Bangkok to Canada for their, um, uh, for their jet fighters. Um, so we've had to relook at how potentially we can survive during this period by earning, uh, earning uh, re revenue. Um, some of the other things that have been quite challenging for us is now traveling down route um, where we go to a lot of countries where because of their COVID rules, we have to be confined to our rooms. In some places, if you step outside of your room, you get fined. Um, people are you know, having to uh, implement some very, very um, uh, almost harsh measures to ensure that they contain infection rates in their country. And unfortunately, it doesn't make for a, a great time. But we you know, this is all very um uh, temporary. Also, on the positive side, is that the airlines have been getting involved in uh, carrying out what I would probably call some sort of humanitarian type work, um, repatriating people. So, at the early part of COVID, we were uh, bringing people back from 
um, South America, from the Far East, you know, people that would have otherwise been um, stuck down route um, with uh, through government charters uh, and, and, and bringing them back. So that's been some of the positive uh, effects um, of aviation. So right, really right now is what we're looking towards is, is countries starting to lift their lockdown rules so that people are starting to travel. And whilst a lot of people who had aspirations to become a pilot have probably been disheartened by what they've seen, um, it's a cyclical industry. Every time we've gone through what we think is the worst disaster in the world, the aviation industry has picked up again. One thing's for sure, time doesn't stand still and our pilots get older. And believe me, we've got a lot of people coming up for uh, retirement. And had COVID not come, we would have had a, a massive recruitment drive over the world. Yeah, there was a, there's, a, there's a huge pilot shortage, in fact, had COVID not come in. So this is just going to delay the effects of that recruitment. So another two years have passed. A lot of people are going to retire. And one thing that's always inevitable, in their effort to cut costs, the aviation industry does tend to put a massive axe whenever it feels that its um, business is under threat, it puts a massive axe through the staff. And the problem with that is that when business starts to pick up, suddenly we find ourselves massively short of people. And then it's like we can't recruit them fast enough. So it's just going to be a matter of time. Hopefully the worst of the effects of COVID have passed. And so we could probably look towards uh, 2022 with much more uh, optimism uh, than we have. So I would say hang in there if you're aspiring to be a pilot there's a lot of old people like me about to <laughs> about to retire over the coming years and somebody's going to have to take up our uh, up our positions to keep the airplanes flying yeah that is very true there's a lot of people who are looking forward to getting into the uh, pilot industry uh, so obviously that concludes our podcast for today and again i would just like to thank you uh, Manish Bhai, for taking your time uh, to talk to all of us uh, about uh, the insights of uh, aviation and the industry as a whole. And Vivek Bay, well, thank you for giving me this uh, uh, opportunity to do this. And if I may um, end by saying that perhaps the biggest um, uh, influence in any success in uh, any job that you might be aspiring to, and I'll probably use my own personal exam uh, example, is is um, uh, Pujya Bapa, who has been my sole supporter, um, my inspirer, and ultimately his Ashirwad has um, topped it all uh, for me and enabled a dream come true. Thank you. That concludes the first season of the BAPS Campus podcast series. We hope you are able to take something meaningful away from our various discussions. A feedback form is available through the link in the description and we encourage all listeners to fill out this short form to help us improve the series ahead of a season two. If you would like to ask any follow-up questions to any one of our guests, then please do not hesitate to contact the team on campus at uk.baps.org. Thank you and Jason.